Okay, uh, Suzanne, what are your questions? Um, sporophyte, sporangium, and sporangia and spores. Yeah, I'll bet you are. Uh, okay, well, two of those words, one's a singular, one's a plural, so that's easy enough. Sporophyte, sporophyte is the structure that produces spores. In biology, uh, it we fight, P-H-Y-T-E, that refers to a structure that contains something. So sporophytes are the structure in which you find the spores. So in, 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 in the ferns, in the ferns, the sporophyte is the big fern frond thing that we were talking about just a few seconds ago about ferns. Because if you look on the back where the sori, the little brown dots, that's where the spores are being made. So that's the sporophyte, okay? In the mosses, that little very wispy thing with the capsule at the top, that was the sporophyte because that produced the spores, right? Um, when we get into uh, uh, the flowering plants, like, or, or, or when we get into the vascular plants, the seed plants, the conifers, the pine trees, the sporophyte is the tree, because now it's real simple. You can't see the gametophyte in those. Remember, that's the whole point of what happened when we moved into the seeded plants. The gametophyte, male and the female, becomes, very, becomes small, 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 becomes microscopic. It wasn't quite microscopic in the ferns. It was still big enough you could see it on the microscope slide. But inside of the seed plants, the, the, the pines and the flowering ones, that's become so small. It's, we had to use a microscope to look at it the other day in lab, okay? So it's all sporophyte. So, uh, so the sporophyte is the thing that makes the spores. All right. On the sporophyte, the, uh, the specific part that makes the spores is called the sporangium. More than one sporangium, those little sori, those brown dots is made up of many sporangium, are many sporangia. So that's the one I'm talking that's just singular and plural, right? And then the sporangium, one, or the sporangia, many, make spores. How's that? Yep, good deal. Okay, uh, gametophyte, where does the sperm and the egg come from? Do you recall in lab when we looked at the gametophyte of the mosses and then we also looked at the one of, uh, 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 of the fern, do you remember we looked for structures on the gametophytes? We said these were the structures in which sperm or egg were being produced. Do you remember what the name of those structures were? They both start with the same letter actually. One produced the sperm, and one looked like a vase, if you recall, in, 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 in um, well, distinctly in the, uh, one of the ferns we looked at. looked like a vase. There you go. Now, those are on the gametophyte. In the, in the moss, the gametophyte is the little tiny green thing, right? Remember in the mosses, the gametophyte is what you see. It's the little tiny green wispy things. But at the tip of those wispy things, the tip, the very end of them, that was what, that's what was on your microscope slide. At the tip, there are antheridia and archegonia, depending on whether it's a male or a female gametophyte. How's that? Good. All right. Any other questions? How about you, Madison? Anything that we need to talk about? A lot of terms, I know. The best way to get through those terms uh, is, is flashcards. Or Suzanne, I know you use the, um, uh, oh shoot, you talked about the other, the flashcards online, what, quiz, Quizlets. That's a very good way to familiarize yourself with these terms. And, 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 I, and I know this is basically memorization and we sometimes think that memorization isn't learning, uh, but, uh, but think about the way you learned your times tables when you were kids, three times three is nine, three times four, you memorized them, didn't you? Sometimes there are things to memorize. So when it comes to terminology, sometimes it's just best to do those flashcards or quizlets or whatever you have, little devices to help you remember what is what. So when you see the words on exam and when you write them, you know what they mean, right? All right, well, if anybody doesn't have any questions and I'm ready to go back and start talking about worms, we, we left off yesterday talking uh, about, um, let me get that out of the way, there we go. We left off yesterday talking about the segmented worms. Now. Yeah, interestingly enough, if we go back to the beginning of the semester, I love how I've drawn these parallels. 
years ago, many years ago, before I studied biology, so that was a long time ago, worms were classified taxonomically in the group. We said, oh, all worms belong to the groom. I can't remember the name of what it was, but it was all this, uh, it, they were the worms and, and they, they were all in this group because they were worms and they all looked alike and they must have been related. Well, we know quite clearly, quite clearly that's not the case anymore, right? Just because you look alike. So it's interesting how we talk about, we see we the flatworms uh, yesterday, today we're going to do the segmented worms, and then we're also going to talk about the round worms. So are, there are many types of worms, and so just because you look like a worm, again, doesn't mean you're related. But these kinds of worms, these segmented worms that we're talking about, of course, they are all related. And the first one that I want to talk about are the segmented worms, and you can look at the pictures quite clearly why they're segmented, and I've already talked about the benefits uh, of being segmented, right? Uh, but these particular types of segmented worms, the uh, the annelids, the, the segmented worms, the annelida phylum that I started yesterday, belong to a group we call the Arantian, the Arantian clade of the annelids. Now, Arant means to travel. So what that means by that is that these particular worms move. They have, the, like all animals, have the ability to move, but they move and they move much more, uh, b -b 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 -b, let's say, efficiently than the other kind of worms. Uh, which I haven't introduced you to, but the other kind of worm is the worm that you, you know about. The other kind of worm is earthworms, and actually in that group too are the uh, leeches. And leeches don't move hardly much at all. Again, they're parasites. So this is the moving group. This is the uh, 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 the, the segmented worm group, and, and it's always easy for me to remember which group is which because on these worms, if you compare them to like an earthworm, these worms aren't relatively smooth, right? They got these appendages that are hanging off. Now, in the picture in the upper right, I show you what those appendages, those appendages are called parapodia. So they're little like, I don't want to call them legs or anything like that, but they're the little projections. A lot of these species are marine. A lot of them live in the ocean. Some are in freshwater. There aren't any terrestrial. So those parapodia are great for moving around, right, locomotion, but they're also thin, thin, so they're good for gas exchange. Right, so they're good for that diffusion of gases across the membrane. So that's great, right? In, in, we talk about uh, in biology how uh, things have many more than one more than one function, right? Oh, at the tip, at the tip are these things called CD. Now I'm sorry to confuse you, but in the picture I spell it one way, and in the text there I spelled it the other way. I spelled it with the CH, but it's KD or CD. But that's the little chitinous projections. You can just see them at the tip of the parapodia that stick out from the side. And in the earthworm, right, the other group of this, which don't have the parapodia, although they do have the CD, they used those CD for getting traction into the soil so they, so they could move around. All right, so a lot, a lot of members of this group are mobile. Some are, some are drifters, some are planktonic, and uh, engage in a, in a wide variety of, uh, of food obtaining uh, 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 techniques, uh, predators and grazers. They're always easy to tell because they're segmented with these large uh, uh, appendages sticking out the side. Uh, lugworms fit in this group too. Their appendages are a little less. They're more like, you can see the little lumps. The lugworm is the thing in the, what a great name, right? Lugworm. I'd always heard that sea mice, when people talked about uh, uh, segmented worms, they said, in another example of these bizarre group of organisms called sea mice, I'm like, what the heck is a sea mice? And why is it called that? That's a sea mice. Sea mouse? It, it looks like hair. It's not a hair. It's those para modified parapodia again. That's actually a worm. So I guess that's, I guess that's the sea mouse or the mice part of it. Uh, tube worms belong in this group. So before I go to the next group of worms, let me let me show you specifically tube worms. Tube worms are named that because they live in these tubes. Now they live like oh god, uh, two uh, two uh, thousand meters down in the ocean. So they can live in very deep down where there's no sunlight, no sunlight whatsoever. For example, this deep sea tube worm uh, known as Riftia lives around these hydrothermal vents. Remember we talked about those back in. 25 when we talked about how life may have begun on earth uh inside of these tube worms the tube worms have no gut they're the adults are gutless uh they have these sulfur oxidizing bacteria who actually oxidize the hydrogen sulfides coming out of the geothermal vent and they use that in a process similar to photosynthesis uh, again i'm referencing back to chapter 25 when we talked about that but those these are also segmented worms 
and they belong to that uh, Arantian group. Okay, now the other group, the one that you're very familiar with and one that you're familiar with but maybe haven't seen a lot of are the earthworms and the leeches. This is a group that's typically less mobile. So within the annelids, we've broken the group down into those that move around a lot, relatively speaking, and those, and those that don't move around so much. So the uh, our, our ranchians, the ones in the ocean, are very mobile. And these guys, earthworms, they move, but not a whole lot. Leeches move, they do. Uh, but again, being a parasite, you really don't move a lot. You're really more a matter of just sitting, waiting around for some host to walk by. Parasites can often, uh, or leeches can often lay, sit on uh, the leaves. And as you're brushing through the brush, uh, you know, walking through the uh, through the forest or whatever, they'll uh, they'll connect onto you from uh, from the leaf. Now they don't look like this, like the one in the upper right right away. They're relatively smaller. The one in the upper right is full. He's been having his meal. Uh, this is actually a medicinal leech. They've been using medicinal leeches in medicine. One of the things I hear that it does is it tends to clean up uh, necrotic or or dead tissue around a wound. So maybe back, you know, in the ancient time when they were using leeches, there was some uh, actual uh, medical purpose to it, interestingly enough. Um, oh, the uh, group, when I was going to school, the segment of worms, we actually called the group of leeches the, the Hyrudinians, and that's because they produce some material, just like, just like we were talking about with the, the vectors, the tsetse fly and the uh, malaria mosquito. The idea behind a blood meal is you gotta, you gotta not, you gotta prevent the blood from clotting. So in the leeches, they use something called hyrudin, which is an anticoagulant. To, to to make that happen, you can see in that picture of whoever the uh, whoever the volunteer is, you can see the blood around the mouth of the of the leech as it's uh, begin to you know basically uh, rasp its way through the skin. Um, these organisms, the earthworms and leeches, are hermaphroditic, uh, although they do uh, frequently engage in cross fertilization. So hermaphroditic means you have both male and female organs. Uh, but to prevent this uh, inbreeding and to get that genetic diversity, typically two hermaphrodites will swap sperm for egg in one and, and vice versa. The smooth area, the smooth area that you see on, uh, on earthworms, uh, the smooth area is, uh, is called a clitellum. Uh, in leeches, you don't have that smooth area. If you're trying to think of what I'm talking about in the next picture, you'll see the smooth area that I'm, that I'm going about. Uh, but they only have the clitellum during breeding season. Uh, they are segmented, but not segmented internally. So they don't, uh, when you're a parasite, you tend to simplify your internal organs. So they don't have that segmented partitioning that we saw in the earthworms. Uh, they're pretty much, but they are segmented on the outer surfaces. Uh, they don't have CD uh, uh, or KD because they're parasites. They don't really, they're not really concerned about mobility. They use suckers to hold on to their, uh, to their host. Not all of them are hematophagous, that second word, which means to feed upon blood. Uh, some of them actually feed upon detritivores. They feed on decaying uh, organic material. Weird looking critters. Uh, these organisms cannot regenerate, by the way, or, uh, like, uh, like, uh, like the earthworms can. All right, so the other group, the sedentaria group, are the earthworms, uh, no definitive head, no parapodia. Uh, they do have a CD or key, but just a few. Uh, the other group, the Arantians, had lots of parapodia uh, and lots of key. Uh, hermaphroditic cross fertilizers. There's a little picture from my, uh, from my zoology book when I was in college. See, that's the kind of pictures we had. Black and white line drawings, maybe a little red in, ink in there for highlight, but that's what we're showing. The clitellum being the smooth part, two hermaphroditic earthworms lay side by side and cross fertilize each other. And that, that, that keeps the diversity going. Um, interestingly enough, when you're a relatively simple organism like this, you can do things like regenerate from either end. So you can uh, cut off the end of an earthworm and it grows back. There's other kinds of uh, earth, or worms that fit in this group down below. Those are acorn worms. Those are actually uh, in marine uh, organ, uh, organisms. They live in the ocean. Just to show you a little close-up of the kitty down in the lower right, see the little chitinous things. That, again, that's what they kind of get traction with going to the soil. Farmers love these things. An acre of farmland will have 50,000 earthworms, and they produce 18 tons of casting. What's a casting? Casting is as the earthworm crawls through the soil, it secretes a mucus 
to help it slip through the soil. And, and earthworms are, are suspension feeders. So that means that they take in the dirt, get out the nutrients, and then pass the dirt out the other end. The castings are, the, are what we call cleaned dirt. So the nutrients have been removed. And one of the reasons farm, uh, farmers like this is because they're good at recycling nutrients, as they call around. Uh, and the, uh, uh, the, the holes they make aerate the soil. And that's good for, for crops as well. Charles Darwin wrote a whole giant book about earthworms and their importance in agriculture. That's how that's how important they are. Okay, folks. So um, that's the Lophotrochozoa group. That's this group. That's the word I just said. And now we're going to move on to uh, a, a small group, a relatively small group, the nematodes, and then a much bigger group, which we'll spend the rest of lecture on talking about, or the arthropods. The arthropods, the insects, the crustaceans and those critters. The uh, the nematodes, those are the roundworms, which is what we're going to dissect in uh, in class uh, uh, on uh, on Monday for Monday's lab. Uh, again, to remind you about the ectozoa and their molting, ectdiasis, the word means to molt, and the blue crabs, that's the, blue, the Florida blue crab, you can see it's it's molting. And, and, and by molting, what we mean is it sheds its exoskeleton because as these organisms grow and get too big, their exoskeleton does not. And there's there's a locust right there, and that uh, that to the right is its chitinous exoskeleton, its molt. So two two members of this group, the roundworms, and then the more familiar like the insects. So let's go to the roundworms first, the group Nematoda. Right down there on the right. I always remember roundworms from the other ones that nematode were the roundworms because there's an O in the word. So that helped me remember nematode roundworms. 25,000 or so species. There might be 20,000 more. All uh, They're called eelworms, roundworms. That's a picture of a roundworm down in the lower left is the, is the roundworm you're going to uh, dissect on Monday. There's sexual dimorphism in this particular species. You'll be able to tell male from the female. The males have the, the hook at the end. Females do not, and the males are smaller than females. Vinegar eels, uh, they're not eels, eels are fish, but they're worms that can live in vinegar. So they can live in these uh, uh, old spoiled vinegar, will have vinegar uh, worms growing in them. So uh, interesting to live in that kind of uh, pH, you would think. But very uh, abundant group, uh, very diverse. I, I said it was small in, in terms of uh, the different groups that we recognize, but it's not small if you're a nematode biologist. There's a bunch of different species of nematodes. Very important, uh, important in the soil as well. There's a lot of soil nematodes important agriculturally, although there are parasitic ones as well. Uh, unsegmented, uh, basically a tube within a tube body plan. And so I was talking about the other day. They have a mouth, they have an anus, uh, an alimentary canal, uh, no circulatory system. They use diffusion, so they're small. They, they, they have a cuticle, a flexible cuticle, and that's what they have to get rid of when they molt. They get rid of this. When you do the dissections on Monday, if I don't remember, hopefully I will, as you're cutting through with the dissecting knife on the worm, you'll notice at the beginning it's a little, just a little tiny bit more difficult. That's the cuticle, and then it, and then it becomes obviously much easier. As I said, they can be uh, uh, beneficial, obviously, found in all kinds of habitats. That parasites, the longest or the biggest parasite is actually a nematode. Grows, it's a parasite on sperm whale placentas that grows eight to nine meters long. And amazing, like 30 feet long. Marine mammals, and, and this is true for a lot of different species, uh, many organisms, the young are already born with parasites. Many parasites can cross, cross uh, across the placental interface with the with the mother. So a lot of whales and dolphins, like I said, other species, the young are already born with these parasites. So this is a parasite that's parasit parasitic on the, on the placenta of sperm whales. Uh, down in the lower right, the little purple things are uh, parasitic nematodes on, on plant roots. So they can also be, uh, they can also be problematic. We have problems with, uh, with them too. Uh, nematodes in humans, about 50 species are pathological. Uh, probably one of the better known ones is the trichinella worm. There it is on the right. The trichinella worm causes trichinosis. Trichinosis, which uh, is a disease by which the worm actually insists in the musculature, and it causes muscle uh, degeneration, muscle tissue damage. It comes from eating undercooked pork or or some wild game uh, that hasn't been uh, that hasn't been properly cooked. As a kid, I always thought it was 
my dad would say you always my dad was very adamant about always cooking pork we always ate pork very well cooked i think he, for years he was a uh, in high school he was a butcher so i think something had to do with with that perhaps but uh i'd always say why dad so i don't get trigonometry no it's trigonosis uh, nematodes also uh <laughs> infest us in a different way 30 percent of the uh, children in the united states and you might have been one uh one in three had suffered from uh the symptoms of anal itching caused by the pinworm enterobius vermicularis it's not that big a deal you go to the doctor it gives you a pill gets rid of it doesn't cause any serious damage but What's interesting about the anal itching and why that's symptomatic is at night, female pinworms uh, exit out through the anus of, of people, of these children, right? And they lay their eggs around the anal opening. And as the eggs hatch and the larvae hatch, they cause irritation in that, in that, in that region. Uh, one of the ways that doctors used to, maybe they don't anymore, detect it was they would use a piece of tape and place it on the anus of the child and pull the tape off and look under a microscope. See if there are worms on it. The round worm that we're going to uh, that we're going to dissect in class infects about a sixth of the world in terms of uh, uh, impaction, intestinal impaction. This picture here is an X-ray of a woman with uh, a round worm impaction in her intestines. Like a lot of things that have to do with this, that's all related to sanitation. So not such a big issue here. In areas of the world where that's taken care of. I've got a little thing that I got from the CDC on the right that shows how uh, roundworms are passed. Uh, basically, uh, embryonic eggs are ingested by the human up at the top, and that's going to be the sanitation part. Those will be in the water. The larvae hatch in the small intestines. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. This is not the roundworm. This is the pinworm. Uh, the male and the female uh, exist inside of the colon or the intestines. Uh, the gravid females, the females with eggs, migrate to the paraanal region, and that's where they lay the eggs. And the larvae inside the eggs mature four to six hours, causing the itching. I'm sorry, yeah, that's the pinworm. Um, the other one, the fellow in the picture with one leg much bigger than the other, he's suffering from elephantiasis, not titus, but elephantiasis, caused by the Wucheria bancrofti uh, roundworm. That's Wucheria bancrofti in the picture on the bottom. Uh, causing a condition known as phalaricis. Here's how it works in elephantiasis. The worm gets into the lymphatic system of a human being and you have lymph nodes. You, your lymphatic system extends throughout your body. And without getting into too much of the AMP detail, what your lymphatic system does is it drains fluids from your appendages back to your heart, blood and lymph. Okay, blood goes through your circulatory system. I'm sorry, lymph, I meant to say. Lymph is a fluid in your body, and one of the things it does is it helps with your immune system. Scattered throughout your body, there are lymph nodes, you know, under your armpit, in, in your groin area, <clears throat> uh, throughout your chest, and scattered in some other areas as well. And lymph nodes are collections of white blood cells. So as this fluid is coming back from your appendages, it's passing through these lymph nodes. And think of these lymph nodes as being guard shacks. And those lymph nodes with their collection of, um, of white blood cells are looking for anything they ain't supposed to be there, any foreign cell, and they attack it and destroy it. So it's a security uh, of, of device, of security uh, function, if you will. Make sense? The worms get into the lymphatic system and they eventually make their way to the lymph nodes where they begin to reproduce and essentially they plug up the lymphatic system. They plug up the lymph nodes and plug up the lymph uh, of, of, of vessels that are carrying the fluid to the lymph nodes. Now, if that were to happen, let's say in this unfortunate person in the picture, uh, in the lymph node that's on the left side of the groin area, then what would happen is the condition we know is edema, the collection of fluid. His leg is so large because the fluid, the lymphatic tissue, can't get back to the heart because there are these uh, Wucheria worms, sorry, I'm trying to do two things at once. These Wucheria worms have plugged up the lymphatic system. So any place that's downstream from lymph nodes, your appendages would be the big areas, are, are, are oftentimes going to be affected by uh, by uh, by this worm. So that's a little worse than than pinworms, right? All right, the rest of lecture, I think this will probably take me the rest of lecture, is going to be the arthropods. Big group. 
That's how many living arthropods there are at any one time on Earth. I don't even know what number that is, but it's a big one. 10 to the 18th. 10 to the, and right now on Earth, there are 10 to the 18th living arthropods. And that's not just the insects. Insects, the millipedes, the uh, crustaceans, all of those critters belong in the arthropod group. So it's not just the pesty insects. The arthropod is an extremely diverse group, well over a million species, probably easily the most successful, close to two thirds of all animal species are arthropods, mostly insects, mostly insects. Ubiquitous means they're found everywhere. But there's also, uh, uh, see, flies and beetles, butterflies and moths, bees, wasps and ants, those are all insects, uh, other insects. Uh, there are crustaceans that fit in this group, the lobsters, uh, shrimp, arachnids, oh yeah, that's a good group, uh, spiders, ticks, mites and then some other arthropods like the uh like the millipedes and the centipedes but yeah it's mostly insects but there's diversity in other groups as well so this is a neat little chart i found online of the different groups of uh i think this is just insects to be honest with you the different groups of insects and the proportion they make up there's just an outstandingly incredible amount of diversity like i said well over a million species and 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 every time they discover new species very often it tends to be a an insect all right what's the big thing here segmentation if we look back in the fossil record to a bizarre looking little critter uh hallucinogenia there hallucinogenia was an ancient arthropod and hallucinogenia you can imagine what those spikes were there was obviously for protection huh was repetitive pop, 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 right one spike after another. Trilobites came on a little bit later, died off about the Cambrian uh, explosion time. Uh, they have that segmentation. Pop, 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 all right, segments, segments, segments. This is all due to the Hox genes that I talked about, uh, what, yesterday? Yeah, I think we discussed the Hox genes or the day before yesterday. Hox genes, which uh, control the placement of appendages, what appendage goes where. Well, if you duplicate them, right, or you change their sequence of regulation, you can not only repeat the appendages over and over again, but remember I showed you a little, uh, it was the fruit stripe gum coloration that we looked at. If you change the, the way those Hox genes work, you can not only uh, increase the number of appendages or decrease, but you can specialize the appendages. Like in that lobster, that Florida spiny in the lower right, the appendages are the legs in the back, the, uh, 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 the, uh, the tail in the very back is an appendage, the walking legs in the front, all the little appendages I told you about they used to feed, and the antenna, all appendages, all modified appendages. So what do you get from this? You get diversity. So segmentation is another word basically to say uh, animals begin to learn how to accessorize. I'm not just a worm, man. I got these things in the front for sensing, these things for eating my food, these things for walking, maybe some of them for pinching, uh, ones for swimming. I got all kinds of different appendages here. And then what we see in a trend, and you can see it on the Florida spiny lobster there, the segments begin to fuse and become large segments. Uh, like this right here is a fusion of, let me, let me type this rather than try to write it with my right hand, is a fusion of the cephalic segment, the head, and the thoracic, the chest. It's called the cephalothorax. Right, so that becomes the front of the organism with the with, with the with the visceral organs um, uh, uh, and all the sense organs and the walking legs. In the back, the segment of the back that'd be the abdomen, right? The abdomen that would be the segments that's involved in uh, propulsion, right? That's the big and and if that's lobster tail. It's nothing but meat, right? It's muscle. They use that for propulsion. So we can get fusion of segments, specialization of body parts, labor, and, and diversity. This is probably the big thing that led to uh, so much success that the arthropods uh, uh, have then, now, and, and probably forever. There's tons of these things. Uh, characteristics of arthropods, I've already mentioned, uh, segmentation. Remember, not a monophyletic uh, characteristic. Uh, segmented worms are segmented, but they're not closely related to arthropods. We're segmented, and we're not closely related to them arthropods. What's that mean? Segmentation must be a really good environmental trend to have, right? And that's why I've tried to discuss the benefits of it with the annelids and, of course, with these guys. Um, the fusion of the segments we call tagmata, what I just mentioned. So when the things like the head and the thorax fuse and become the cephalothorax, uh, then we have what we call a morphologically functional unit. So think about it as a company 
with the shipping department and the manufacturing department and the administrative department and how that increases or contributes to efficiency, right? Spiders do a little bit differently. Their segments uh, tend to be uh, grouped into larger segments and the names change, but simply like in the spider, prosoma, that's the front segment, and opistosoma is the back segment. The back segment is gonna be where the reproductive organs are, the, uh, the spinnerets where they make the web, the front is going to be the stomach and, and that sort of stuff. So it's a specialization of body parts, right? The exoskeleton made of chitin and protein, very good for protecting these organisms, not only against predators, but also against the uh, hypertonic conditions of the ocean. It can help prevent them from drying out from living in salt water. Uh, in the ocean being able to do that probably is what allowed uh, one of the major contributing things to arthropods being successful on land, right? They moved on to land, desiccation was a problem. So having this uh, chitinous exoskeleton uh, allowed them to survive. Now, of course, having that, if you're going to get bigger in many character, uh, many uh, cases, you're going to you're gonna have to molt, right? You're going to have to get rid of that. I think it was yesterday, and one of the things I had heard that give people, why people get the creeps about insects, if you will, or the willies is the the appendages, the way they move. And that's what this word mean, means, arthropod. That's what this group is known for, is uh, uh, jointed appendages, movable jointed appendages that they can uh, ex uh, extend or retract. Like I said, it can be modified in all kinds of things too. But I found this little graphic online that shows the musculature of a typical arthropod leg. I thought it was kind of neat. I, I think it was neat because if you go on and you do take AMP courses or you take anything that has to do with uh, structure and function, muscular system. Muscles only do one thing. Muscles cannot push. They can only contract. So, for example, when my bicep bend, when my arm bends in, my bicep contracts and it goes back out again, not because my bicep pushes, but my tricep, my antagonistic muscle on the other side pulls. And if you see the little blue and red uh, muscles that are indicating in the picture there, you can see that's the same thing. These little tiny, so think about that next time you see a little insect leg. When they move, they have these little tiny muscles that are moving against each other, causing that leg to flex out and, and to extend. Uh, open circulatory system in arthropods. So uh, closed circulatory system we saw in cephalopods, squid, and all that sort of stuff. Arthropods have open circulatory system. That works, but you're going to stay small. There aren't really any two gigantic arthropods out there. You're not going to get any really big ones. Um, as I said, these appendages can do things, sensory, defense, feeding. Uh, the swimming appendages in many species, like lobsters, for example, can be used in terms of reproduction. Down below is a picture of a gravid female lobster, and the little black dots all over her are her eggs. Gravid means a female that is with eggs, okay? So she will carry those eggs on her swimmerettes, which are the appendages in the back, until they hatch. Uh, if you know anything about lobster harvesting here in Florida, you know that it's illegal to take a female who's gravid, and that's how you know, right? Because you're removing a young from the population. You're moving reproductive uh, uh, influx into the population when you do that. Oh man, do they got some really cool sensory systems? Uh, eyes, yeah, they got eyes that can that have sight. Uh, in terms of light and dark, so they have ocelli. Look down on the bottom on the lower left. Uh, you see the two eyes of the insect, but in the middle, there's these three little white dots. Those are ocelli, and they can tell light and dark. The reason they're in a triangle is because they allow the insect to triangulate where the light is coming from. Isn't that neat? Right? Just like trigonometry. Uh, compound eyes, uh, if you look at the picture up above, the, the one in the blue, that's what I mean by the compound eyes. If we look a little bit closer, it's also in the one uh, that we just looked at, the little tiny segments. Each of those little segments that you see there is called an omatidium, and a collection of those makes up an insect eye. Now, some organisms will have both the ocelli and the omatidium, and some just have the omatidium. Uh, you can see down below, the way the omatidium works, it's really kind of neat. It's kind of like fiber optics. The uh, if, So I'm looking in the picture on the far right in the corner. The crystalline cone focuses the light that the lens receives, and it transmits that light, that light down this thing called the rhabdom. And the rhabdom 
uh, like fiber optic cable glows and the ret uh, retinular cells on either side sense the light. Now, this is not very good for, for seeing detail. You know, uh, insects with compound eyes cannot see detail. What they're really good though at seeing is motion. And since a lot of these uh, uh, insects with compound eyes, if you think about dragonflies and that sort of stuff are predators uh, or even prey, being able to sense motion is, is probably much more important than being able to tell what Charles Darwin really looks like. On the right-hand side, I found this cool picture online. This is Charles Darwin, what he would look like if you had compound eyes, if you had an eye with a bunch of those omatidium. So you see, not real good for detail, but, but, but very good for seeing motion. They can also sense sound. Um, I'm pointing it on the grasshopper. First of all, look at the thing in the red called spiracles. Spiracles are little holes that you see along either side of the grasshopper. I'll talk about what those do in the next slide. But a modified spiracle, a spiracle that's a little bit bigger, becomes a tympanum. Now, a spiracle is a hole. So a tympanum is a hole. It's right underneath the wing of the, of caterf uh, the caterfly, the uh, grasshopper. But the uh, tympanum is the membrane that's stretched over the spiracle. So there's a hole with a membrane stretched over it. Think drum head, right? And you can sense sound that way. So they do, I, I mean, again, it's probably like the sight, how detailed is the sound, probably not the way ours is, but you can certainly tell it. The spiracles, again, they're part of the respiratory system. And this is one of the reasons that we think gave uh, terrestrial uh, uh, arthropods such an advantage when they moved out on the land. Um, when you move on to land, of course, well, through any creature, of course, uh, you got to make sure you get enough oxygen to all your cells. Now, these or organisms have an open circulatory system, which isn't horribly efficient at doing that. But in addition to that, uh, uh, terrestrial arthropods, now marine arthropods have gills. There's a there's some gills. That's a, a horseshoe crab there on the left. Those are called the book gills because the gills look like pages on a book. But the terrestrial arthropods and tiny arthropods can use diffusion. Okay. I got ahead of myself. I got excited when I saw the picture. Terrestrial arthropods use something called trachea. So look there on the right-hand side. Trachea is a series of tubes that get smaller and smaller until they become tracheoles and smaller than that, that wind their way through the uh, insect's body. And they're opening to the outside through these spiracles. Air moving in and out of the trachea into the tracheoles provides oxygen to all the cells in the body. So, so their open circulatory system doesn't work doesn't move gases around as much as their as their trachea system, their respiratory system of views. And again, for terrestrial arthropods, this is probably one of the other things that contribute to their success because having this very efficient respiratory system means higher metabolic rates, right? The more, uh, the better respiratory, the better you are respiring uh, efficiency wise, the higher your metabolic rate so on you can get bigger too now living on land desiccation once again hits you in the face so these spiracles actually have valves that open and close to prevent water loss kind of like the stomata uh, that you learned about in plant cells so see there's a couple of really very interesting innovations that these organisms have come up with that uh, that leads right away to them uh, living on land and arthropods insects especially are dominant creatures on land uh, the excretory system, another one, very good at retaining uh, retaining water. Uh, for those in the uh, in the in the aquatic realm, diffusion works for you. But for those that live on land, we use these things called Malpighian tubules. And if you remember the flame cells from the flatworm and uh, the flame cell basically from the segmented worm, what you basically the flame cell was the cilia beating in the water, the liquid pours down into the tubules and out the body. Same sort of idea. The Malpighian tubules are the yellow tubes that you see, see sticking up. Salt, water, nitrogenous waste from the body cavity of the organism. Right? So this is an open circulatory system. So surrounding the pink, the, the, the digestive system of the grasshopper above is this hemolymph that we were talking about. So salt, waste, nitrogenous waste, uh, uh, water, nitrogenous waste move out that way. Uh, the, the, the larger chunks, right, the, uh, of material are moving down through the digestive system. Uh, interesting enough, what happens with kidneys, kind of same thing happens in humans. 
while the salt and water is initially filtered out, later on in the rectum, reabsorption occurs of salt and water. We kind of do the same thing as well. We Our kidneys filter out uh, all the bad things, all the waste in our body, but they also filter out water. And later on in our rectum, we reabsorb, we reabsorb that water. So they do the kind of the same thing. So Malpighian tubules for excretory, getting rid of nitrogenous waste, very concentrated, like uric acid or guanine, very concentrated, very efficient uh, conservation of, uh, for water. All about living on land with these guys. Uh, there are arthropods in the ocean, right? The crustaceans that we talked about. Remember that made a relatively small group of the arthropods. The biggest group of the arthropods are going to be the land-dwelling ones. Okay, let's go the, with these groups of arthropods. We have the chelicerates, the myriapods, uh, then the insects. We're not going to discuss the uh, remipidians. Uh, and then a group of that we lumped together called the other crustaceans, which lumped in with the insects. This is a new classification known as the pan crustaceans. But let's go with the chelicerates first. Uh, the chelicerates are called that because they have fangs or pinchers. They have chelicera. And those fangs or pinchers, once again, are modified appendages. Uh, two body segments, the front, the cephalothorax, and the abdomen. And yes, as you can imagine by this picture, this is the spiders and the ticks, the mites, the scorpions, the, the daddy long legs, which is not a true spider. We'll talk about that in just a second. The horseshoe crabs and sea spiders. Uh, only, uh, only, only spider that found in, uh, in the water would be uh, the sea spiders in the marine ocean. Uh, most uh, chelicerates are arachnids, spiders, scorpions, uh, ticks, uh, and mites, but there are uh, there are other types as well. Uh, first of all, why is daddy long legs not a true spider? In the upper right is a spider, and then a harvestman is a daddy long legs. Spiders have two body parts. They have the the opisthoma, right? So they have the cephalothorax, or and the, and and the and the prosoma. I got those backwards. The prosoma is the cephalothorax. Harvestman, you know, only has one body section. So is it a spider? Yes, but when it comes to technical definition, that's why you see sometimes it's not, not a true spider. Horseshoe crabs are chelicerates. You see this all over the beach in Florida. The golden orb weaver, banana or garden spider we talk about here in Florida, beautiful. Orb weaver, not all spiders are orb weavers. This one spins a web or an orb. And it is actually, it is actually golden in color if you look at it in the, in the right light. The Florida bark scorpion in the lower left, that's a Florida, we have that in, in Florida. I haven't seen any around Lake Sumter, but I see them around here in, in Oviedo every once in a while. Uh, and then the little buddy, the red bug, the chigger, which causes those bites on your legs if you get them bad enough. Those are all uh, lovely creatures, right? All chelicerates. Uh, most of those, again, being, being arachnids, the spiders, the scorpions, the ticks, the mites. Um, these guys here. Dog ticks, deer ticks, see the difference between the two? We don't really have too much of a, a trouble with deer ticks here in Florida. It's mostly a concern in the um, Midwest, but there are deer ticks here. Dog ticks are a more common one. I just pulled one off myself the other day when I got out of the woods. Uh, arachnids have six pairs of appendages. They have a pair of chelicerae, which are their attacking fangs. So that's a, that's a modified appendage. They have these really cool things called pedipalps in the front. Pedipalps are sensing organs. This is the male pedipalps of a, a particular species of spider. So the pedipalps will have these uh, basically taste cells on them, and they can stick those down into the ground and around to sense things, to, uh, for, for, uh, for obviously for, for eating. And then uh, four pairs of walking legs. Uh, book lungs uh, in these organisms, same thing that we saw in the horseshoe crab. Spinnerets, if you're an orb weaver, that's where your spinnerets would be. Uh, all spiders have poisonous glands. All spiders are active hunters. Neat organisms. There's the black widow. Black widows are the ones that have the red dots on the belly. Oftentimes the red dots look, look like an hourglass. Uh, not seeing any black widows on Lake Sumter, but used to have a lot when I taught at Valencia years ago. They used to get up the lights in the overhead. Black widows are neurotoxic, like a cobra. You get bit by a black widow. If you die, you die because of paralysis of the muscles so you can breathe. The other one, the brown recluse, another one we have in, in, in Florida, is hematoxic. So it's like a rattlesnake. When they bite you, that's the picture you see down below, it causes tissue necrosis, tissue death. 
that's not taken care of. That dude's was a thumb, toe. Anyway, he's gonna rot off eventually. One's a quicker death, one's a slower death, I guess. All right, if you're closing your eyes because the spiders, you can open them now. We've moved off the spiders. Now we're going to talk about that group that have lots of feet. Myriapods, a myriad, myriad, a lot, pod, feet. These are the centipedes and the millipedes, right? They do have lots of feet, don't they? Um, well, basically, what we have in centipedes and millipedes is just segmentation uh, uh, in a very simple form. Bop, 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 segments one after the other. It's actually how they grow. The young actually grow by adding segments. Da, 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 da. So my guess is if you're somebody who studied these, you probably could tell, I don't guess tell how old they are, but how many segments they are. Males and females, terrestrial, so they're internal fertilizers and they lay eggs. All very common. Gun orchid is the male and female. Centipedes and millipedes, <clears throat> differences. Centipedes, fewer legs, one per, one per appendage. Uh, millipedes, more legs, two per appendage. Actually, one per appendage, but then evolutionarily speaking, they fused. So there's not a hundred or a thousand. There's just fewer or more. Centipedes have fewer legs. Uh, millipedes are usually not a problem. They tend to be her herbivorous. They defend themselves by smelling bad. <laughs> Uh, some even produce a type of, uh, of a cyanide gas, which is uh, uh, posted, uh, supposed to disturb, uh, deter predators. Centipedes a little bit different. They're carnivorous, uh, and they have poisonous fangs or claws that they can use. Pretty, pretty substantial, too. The one down below, that centipede, that is a Florida centipede. Okay, uh, the other crustaceans. So in the pan crustacean group, so we'll do uh, the decapods first. Yeah, let's look at the decapods. Uh, decapods, uh, well, I'm sorry, the crustaceans first, excuse me, just the regular crustaceans, then the decapods. Uh, crustaceans is a largely marine group. There are some freshwater, the copepods are freshwater. Uh, three pairs of appendages that have been modified for chewing, various pairs of legs. Uh, diffuse across their gills or cuticle. They're usually small critters. They all have a nopleus larval stage. The nopleus larval stage, this is the picture of the nopleus larva. This is an actual microscope uh, photograph of a nopleus larvae. Uh, nopleus larvae, uh, common larval stages, commonality of descent is very good indicators of, of relationships, close relationships. So all crustaceans, whether we're talking about the copepod up above, the little krill, the important, uh, that real important shrimp that uh, many uh, filter feeding like uh, marine mammals eat on, uh, crabs, uh, this is a roly poly. Roly poly is not an insect, by the way. Roly poly, little black bugs that we play with, they roll themselves up in the ball's defense. It's actually a crustacean. All of these organisms, all of these have the same larval stage. It's kind of like the fact that annelids uh, and mollusks both have the trochophore larval stage I talked about yesterday. It says, you know, they're related. Same thing here, right? Whenever we see organisms with common, or lar common larval stages, we know that we're talking about critters that are closely related to one another. Roly polies, their actual name is pill bugs, but again, those aren't insects. Those are uh, those are actually crustaceans. Now, the other type of crustacean is the decapod. I said earlier, the ten-footed crustacean. These are the crabs uh, and and the lobsters. Uh, five pairs of thoracic appendages, ten so ten feet. Calcium carbonate exoskeleton. The carapace is the part that covers the uh, cephalothorax. So uh, in lab on uh, what Tuesday, when we do the uh, crayfish, you'll pull off the carapace to see the internal organs of the crayfish. You'll pull off the cephalothorax segment, which is covered by the carapace. The swimmerettes, so the modified appendages in the back, they're used for reproduction that I showed you. Uh, abdomens of these of members of this group are usually sexually dimorphic, so you can tell sexes apart from them. Uh, that's because the females generally carry the eggs on the abdomen. So the abdomen uh, of, uh, of, for example, female crabs is usually going to be wider. Uh, the abdomen in the picture of the blue crab in the upper right is the blue part here. And then the abdomen of, of the male is that thin little thing running right down the middle. 
May, uh, females oftentimes will carry the eggs of their young on their abdomen, so they'll have a more substantial abdomen. So that's how you can tell them apart. Uh, when it comes to uh, the difference between lobsters and, and crabs, we all know, but, but technically speaking, the difference between a crab and a, 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 and a lobster is crabs have a very broad carapace, that's the top part, and, and a, usually a very small uh, abdominal uh, section. Even if it's bigger in the females, it, overall, it's the top part that's bigger. Whereas when we look at the, the, the lobsters, the lobsters have a much thinner carapace. They're more thin body frame. So crabs seem to be more spread out is what we're kind of trying to say here. Uh, crayfish is going to be uh, the example of the organism that we're going to uh, dissect in class. Barnacles fit in this group too. Now, originally, this is a great uh, story of convergent evolution again. Originally, barnacles were thought to be mollusks because they had shells, uh, but you uh, have learned by now that doesn't mean anything. And they were reclassified as uh, arthropods because when you look at the uh, little appendages, these little things that are sticking out, they're jointed. They're jointed appendages. They're segmented jointed appendages. The larvae of barnacles too, the larvae, Anopleus larvae. So it's a crustacean as well. So definitely not a molly. Uh, barnacles are the things that we see growing on whales. Oftentimes they'll hitch a ride on the whales. It's really sort of uncertain whether they damage the whale. The How they anchor themselves down the whale only anchors down into the blubber layer of the whale. And the blubber layer doesn't have, it's not sensory, it's not innervated. I guess the only thing that you would think about and barnacles can attach themselves to ship as well. They have very strong glue that they can glue with. They have, they have these, these threads of glue that uh, manufacturers are fascinated by because it's very good at gluing in water, underwater, salt water. But they can use this and they, they stick themselves uh, to these organisms and, and to ships. Uh, hydrodynamic drag is a concern, obviously. You get enough of these, then uh, you would slow down being able to move through the water. The appendages uh, have been modified in this case to be nothing more than filter feeders. These are filter feeders. They use these appendages, they capture stuff out in the water, and then bring it into their mouths. So another modification of the appendage. No walking here, no pinching, just these things to capture stuff. Now, there is one appendage that's been modified. Uh, they are hermaphroditic. So they're male and female. They're sessile. So when you're sessile, being hermaphroditic, uh, one of the things you would want to control against is fertilizing your own eggs. Okay, so if you're a, a worm and you're hermaphroditic, you can cross fertilize like I showed you. But if you're a barnacle, you're sessile. You're stuck where you are. So you want to release your sperm but you, and, 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 and release your egg into the water uh, like a lot of other organisms do. That's fine. But since you can't move around, you're concerned about inbreeding. So Mother Nature has come up with a, a very ingenious uh, uh, workaround for barnacles. Barnacles have the world's largest penis. Okay, there it is. World's large, no, uh, inch for inch or, or scale wise, right? Uh, scale wise for barnacles, they have the world. And the reason why is they use that really large penis to increase their genetic diversity in the group. So instead of fertilizing their own eggs, right? That penis extends out across the distance to their next door neighbor, who's don't have to worry about whether it's a female, everybody's got the everybody's got both parts. That penis then delivers the sperm and we then shuffle up the genetic information. So no matter what anybody ever says, it is the barnacle that 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 scale wise, apple to apples has the world's largest penis. Barnacles are very proud of that, I hear too. Oh boy, insects, tons of them, right? Six-footed organisms. So the decapods were the crustaceans, the crabs, lobsters, 10 feet. These guys are six-footed. Many, many orders. That's just some of them in the background. Odonata are the dragonflies, diptera are the mosquitoes, coleoptera, the scarab beetles. Density and diversity, nobody comes close to the insect group. About half of all named species 10 to uh, 18 insects alive at any one time. So I think that I said begin 10 to 18 arthropods. It's actually just 10 to 18 insects are alive at any one time. Uh, three body segments, the head, the thorax, and then the abdomen. That's actually not formatted, right? The uh, head, thorax, and abdomen should all be together, or the head should be moved over. The head is a, a, a section, the thorax. The thorax is three segments. 
two segments, uh, two legs per segment, sometimes a pair of wings. Wings are appendages, but they're not modified appendages like legs. They're usually outgrowths of the body wall. Um, of course, the wings are also made up of chitin and protein like the exoskeleton. And, and wings, like a lot of critters, would have led a lot to their radiation that occurred in the uh, during the Carboniferous. Remember, at the end of the Carboniferous, when conditions were drying out, organisms were moving out on the land. So having wings would have been very beneficial. Most of these guys are going to see with, uh, with compound eyes, too. Now, when it comes to insects and the diversity is how do they all uh, cooperate? How do they all exist together in the same area? Well, they're extremely diverse when it comes to things like, for example, mouth parts. Mosquitoes have piercing mouth parts, while butterflies have sucking mouth parts. And flies, the way they, when they crawl around your hamburger, they basically spit up a little bit of digestive juice on your burger and then sop it up, lick it up. That's how they get their food. So think about that this summer as those flies are crawling around your food. Mosquitoes pierce down into your skin, uh, and they do it in such a way that many times you don't even feel it. There's actually a unique design in the way that little piercing organ is the design that, uh, that limits your ability to, to sense it. Uh, now, piggy and tubules for, for excretion. I showed you that with the uh, grasshopper in a couple slides ago. Uh, in wind, winged insects, Oh, I love this. This is the commercial on TV where they talk about butterflies are not supposed to fly. Butterflies, or maybe you've even heard this, not butterflies, bumblebees. Bumblebees are not supposed to fly because the bodies are bigger than the wings should be able to support. Now, the bodies look pretty big and the wings look small, I agree. But those that fly, another really cool, unique adaptation, their trachea, remember those air tubes? In many cases, they've been expanded into air sacs. So while a bumblebee body looks pretty big, they're actually kind of light because they have a lot of air sacs in them. So, and I always tell folks when they come up, is it true that bumblebees are really physics impossible supposed to fly? Well, no, because it was physics impossible, then they would fly. Simple as that. Spiracles, uh, if you're an aquatic uh, organism, then many times your spiracles have been permanently closed or uh, if you're parasitic. And oftentimes if you're parasitic, you're endoparasitic, so you just basically use diffusion and you're small. For sensory, they have CD, there's that word again. In this case, the CD are going to be these little hair-like structures that you see down the lower left. Let me remind you that only animals have hair, or only mammals have hair, but they can detect chemical, mechanical, sound signals, sound distorts, uh, you know, the, the, the orientation of these, uh, of these CD. Uh, a tympanum that we talked about, that thin membrane over the tracheal sac to hear sound. Uh, almost all of them secrete something called pheromones. If you've ever had troubles with with uh, uh, ants crawling in your house, like through a door frame, and then you kill all the ants, and then just a short time later you look back and there they are on the same trail again. The reason why the ants are coming exactly in the same place, the reason why they come in your house is because there's something to eat or something. But the reason why they're walking on the same trail, it's kind of like the Hansel and Gretel thing. The ants drop a little chemical along the way, a little pheromone. Pheromone is I like to think of them as external hormones. And this pheromone, and a hormone is nothing more than relays the communication. Uh, and in this particular case, uh, this pheromone is an external communication about here's where the trail is. Now, they use it for trail markers or mating signals. Females will secrete pheromones when they're sexually receptive for males. The mosquito larvae there, I showed you this the other day, right? Remember I was telling you about the oil on the water, how it suffocates? That's because they use that little tube that extends up above to get air. And when you cover it with oil, that, that's gone. So back to the ants for a second. If you want to get rid of those uh, ants crawling along that trail, what you do is you kill the ants, and then you got to use something like bleach and really clean the, clean the pheromones up. Sexual reproduction, usually internal fertilization, being land dwellers, that makes sense. A lot of them undergo metamorphosis. Metamorphosis is important, uh, perhaps in, in many cases, for resource competition because the young don't eat the same thing as the adults. So we've talked about this idea of young and adults competing for resources. So one of the ways you could do that is through a process of metamorphosis. And insects have two kinds. There's what we call incomplete, and uh, incomplete metamorphosis is basically the young on the left is incomplete in the little pictures there. 
the young, the nymphs look like just smaller versions of the adult or complete, which is what the butterfly is doing in the picture in the background. In complete, you have a caterpillar and a very distinctive from the adult, which is the butterfly or the, uh, or the moth. And again, uh, these uh, metamorphic individuals, like, especially when you talk about the caterpillar and the butterfly, they eat different things so they can live in the same place. So everybody can live happy with one another, I suppose. All right, let's look at the groups of insects. A uh, couple of smaller groups that I'm not going to discuss, but I am going to move down into the wing winged insects. I guess uh, the silverfish, because I see them all the time, are kind of cool. That's a neat group. That's a very unique unto itself type of group. So among the winged insects, you can break it down into the uh, those that are the complete metamorphosis and those that are incomplete. What I've done through each of these is I've gone through and put a little a cue as to how I remember who's what. Uh, for example, the coleoptera, a coleus is a sheath. So these are the ones with sheathed wings. I'm gonna come back to this picture. Those are coleopterists. This mount of this male snout weevil is a coleopteran. They have they have the wings that uh, they have two sets of wings. So they have the outer wings and then the, the inner wings. Uh, the diptera, diptera have only two wings. So uh, they don't have uh, 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 outer wings and, uh, and inner wings, right? So two two wings only. There's diptera. Uh, mosquitoes are diptera as well. Uh, so the beetles, you know, back to the, the, the coleoptera for a second. Remember, once again, if you've ever seen a beetle, they have that, 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 you know, part of the body looks like wings that opens up and then the flying wings are underneath. That's what I mean by one set or two set of wings. Diptera only have... Uh, only have uh, a single pair of wings. Uh, hemiptera, hemiptera are the uh, the bees, uh, and those they have very membranous, very thin wings. So uh, the reason why I wrote the birds and the bees is uh, a hymen is the uh, is the tissue that is that is torn when a uh, when, when a vet, uh, when a female a, a virgin female has sex the first time. So I think about a thin piece of membrane. I remember birds and bees, thin piece of membrane, hymenoptera. Those are bees. I know it's a little bit convoluted sometimes in the steps I go through, but these are just little ways that I try to remember. Lepidoptera are the uh, butterflies, moths. They have scaly wings. There we go. This is actually not a bird. This is a hummingbird hawk moth. That's a moth. That's a big moth, isn't it? But they're, they have scaly wings, so that's the Lepidopterus. Yeah, you know, last semester had one of those for his field note. We actually saw one. Among the incomplete metamorphosis, there are the hemiptera, which are half wings. They don't really have half wings, but what they have is they have a textured wing, and then they have a non-textured wing. So let me see if I can. Well, you can just see it. So the textured wing has the coloration on it, and then there's the non-textured wing underneath it. Little different than the coleoptera. They have two sets of wings too, but the outer uh, set of wings is different on those. And then the last group, I won't go back and forth, orthoptera. These are uh, the spear bear katydid. This is a katydid. These are the more traditional insects. That's what orthoptera is, the orthodox, orthodox insects. So I'm not gonna expect you to know all the orders, but there's a couple of other ones. Uh, Odonata, my favorite one, the, the dragonflies. Odonata because they do actually have teeth. Uh, you go to uh, orthodontist. There we go. Which I think, who do you go to when you have your teeth looked at? Orthodontist. The isoptera, uh, iso means equal. Uh, termites have equal sized wings. Uh, siphonoptera are fleas. They jumpers. They're not, they don't have wings. So aptera means without wings. It's interesting dragonflies get caught in my back porch and I always think with their compound eyes, they can see the outside, but they can't see the screen. It must just blow their little insect minds to figure out why can't I see the outside, but I can't get there. You know, we made it through the arthropods. I think I'm going to move on through and finish up chapter 33 then. We only got a little bit to go through the deuterostomes and that way all we have left then is uh, the vertebrates. So we'll keep pushing on because we, we still have quite a bit more time. So now the deuterostomia. So we'll do uh, just the echinoderms today. We'll do the chordates when we start in chapter 34. The deuterostomia. So deuterostomia, mouth uh, forms second, anus forms first. So that's the uh, the rhinoceros, man, uh, sea stars, this weird thing called the sea cucumber, sharks. 
reptiles, snakes, anything else, vertebrates for the most part. Not all of them, right? Because obviously echinoderms are not vertebrates. So let's go to that first. Let's look at the echinoderms. Echinoderm means spiny skin. And if you ever felt a sea star, if you're not, then you will in the lab. You can see what I mean by spiny skin, right? Kind of dermata. Exclusively marine. There are no freshwater, no terrestrial versions of echinoderms. Uh, radial symmetry, but what we call pentaradial. Very often, and not in all cases, not all sea stars have five, but very often uh, uh, the, the, the symmetry is in five. Not only in the sea star, but even when we look at sea biscuits, this is a sea biscuit here on the right. And then above it is the sand dollar. Sea biscuits are thicker. Sand dollars are thinner. Of course, you know, this is not the way they really look. They're not white. They're white when they're dead. They should have a brownish green color when they're alive. Um, now, interestingly enough, they have radial symmetry, pentaradial symmetry in some of them with, as an adult. But as a larvae, their symmetry is this. This is the larvae of, the, of an echinoderm. They have, they have bilateral symmetry as a larva, which is interesting, not so much today, but when we come back and talk about what group of invertebrates or what group of these, uh, of, of the critters we've been talking about so far gave rise to the vertebrates, it's going to be uh, 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 tying a lot to do with the similarity of larval forms. So we'll get back to that when we do talk about that. The nervous system is a ring with some radial branches, but there's no brain, no centralization of function. They have an endoskeleton, so kind of like us. Uh, it's not a skeleton with bones, but the, uh, they have an, uh, an epidermis uh, that covers this endoskeleton made of calcium carbonate plates, these real hard plates, which we call uh, ossicles. So these are the sea stars, uh, the brittle stars, which I don't have a picture of here, the sea urchins. There we go. Sand dollars and sea biscuits. Sea urchins have a test as well, just like the dinoflagellates and the diatoms we talked about. Uh, if you took all the spines off a sea urchin, that's what you would see would be that test right there. Uh, and then these things called uh, sea fans as well, or I'm sorry, sea pens, not sea fans, sea pens. This is a, this is a sea cucumber. These are kind of germs too. Those are kind of critters. Okay, uh, in echinoderms, unique to echinoderms is something known as the water vascular system. And we'll take a look at this in lab. But uh, basically, the way the water vascular system works is, we're looking at a sea star here. There is a special area on the top of the sea star, and I'll, I'll show it to you in lab, called uh, the madreporite. And the madreporite is like a sieve. Water, ocean water, passes in the madreporite down through a ring canal into a stone canal, or down through a stone canal into a ring canal. Excuse me, got that backwards. Stone canal because it's actually kind of a hard structure. All these are made with calcium carbonate. From the ring canals, the ring canals extend out into radial canals, and radial canals attach to all these little bulb-like things, look like it's upside down vases, these ampulla of these tube feet. Now, if you look on the left-hand side, this is some pictures of sea stars using their tube feet. They can expand those tube feet out, uh, they can attach those tube feet to things, and they can also create a suction with those tube feet, so they can actually use those tube feet to hold on to things with. Uh, two feet that, uh, uh, even in those species who don't have suckers, their two feet can also be used for movement, but they can also use two feet for, for gas exchange. So they can use it as a thin membranous tissue for gas exchange to occur. They can use it to capture prey. Uh, what sea stars do to feed on um, bivalves, sea stars feed on bivalves. What they do is they'll wrap themselves around the two shells of the bivalve, attach their tube feet, and then begin to just pull gently on the bivalve. Now, the bivalve has those two big adductor muscles, prevent it from opening. We talked about that yesterday. But muscles fatigue after a while. So the uh, sea star doesn't pull hard. It just keeps pulling. And after a while, the bivalve weakens and the shell begins to open. Now, the sea star doesn't need to get the valve or get the shell all the way open. All it needs to do is open up the shell big enough because the sea, uh, sea star can then evert its stomach out through its mouth. So its, mouth, its stomach will move out through its mouth into the mantle cavity of the bivalve and then digest it with the digestive enzymes and suck it back up again. So, you know, like I said, there's unique ways of feeding using those two feet. Just, just you know, it's all about patience. Pulling on that 
pulling on those bivalves until those muscles just start to fatigue. Uh, most are sexual reproducers. Uh, some can engage in asexual reproduction. You can split them off. Uh, on the right-hand side is a, a little tiny sea star with one big arm. That actually, that big arm uh, came off of the um, uh, came off of another sea star, and the little part is the part that's growing new out of that. So they can regenerate lost body parts. Uh, they can regenerate arms. Uh, they can regenerate the whole body if part of the central disc is still present in one genus. So one genus, you can have just an arm and a piece of that central disc part. It'll grow a whole new, um, a whole new, um, whole new starfish, whole new sea star. Uh, male and female star uh, sea stars or male and female echinoderms, gametes, they're uh, broadcast spawners. They release their gametes into the water. Uh, with free swimming larvae that I showed you that helps for obviously moving around. Uh, down at the bottom of the tube feet, you look in the little picture up above, uh, the podium, the part at the end of the tube feet, uh, they secrete adhesive and de-adhesive chemicals too. They can use to attach themselves. So that sea star can use suction with those tube feet and, and also adhesive to stick to the shell. This regeneration of lost body parts is interesting. In the lower right is a picture of a sea cucumber engaging in... Uh, uh, predator avoidance. One of the ways that sea cucumbers could uh, prevent themselves from being preyed upon is when a predator messes with them, they can liquefy their internal organs and then they spit them out through their mouth or, uh, or, through, their, or through their anus and it comes out as this white, almost like silly string looking stuff. And it is kind of sticky too. I know a buddy of mine in the Philippines one time, we were diving, we found one, so we started messing with it like it was a football. Probably shouldn't have done that. But anyway, all this stuff started coming out, and it gets all over you and it sticks to you. But again, the idea with the predator, just to get the predator to drop its guard for a second to go, oh, my God, what is that, might be enough the, to dissuade the predator from, from feeding on you. Now, regenerating lost body parts has a very interesting uh, uh, application. There's a lot of interest in it when it comes to medicine. How do echinoderms do that? Because the sea cucumber, when it – regenerates its body parts when it when it liquefies and spits them out it doesn't die it regenerates those lost parts so how does it do that would be something we'd like to find out because we could find out how it does it and we're relatively closely related to these guys especially when it comes to outside of uh, vertebrate animals if we could find out how they do it it might give us some clue how how we could get our, our cells to do that uh, the skin in the upper right before I leave, the skin of sea stars is, is aptly evolved to, to, to protect these organisms. They have spines and the hard calcium carbonate ossicles. Uh, they can also use uh, these outbranches, these dermal branchia. Branchia means gills and dermal is skin. These are like, think about these projections coming out of the skin that they can exchange gases across too. Of course, that's only going to be benef or useful when you live in the water, which is where we're going to find these guys. All right, the different groups or classes, the asteroidia, those are the sea stars and the sea daisies. If you ever want to know what a sea daisy is, there's only three of them. And one of them they just recently discovered in the lower left, uh, Xyloplax genitae in 1986. This sea daisy has only so far been described from the uh, decaying hulls of old wooden ships that have sunk. That, that's actually what the sea daisy looks like in the lower right. It's very small, only a centimeter across. So these particular organisms only live on the decaying wood of, of old wooden ships. Now, if you're thinking, well, where did they live before there were people building wooden ships? Well, trees and wood gets into the water, but uh, uh, that's, a, that's a pretty specialized habitat when you think about it. Uh, many sea stars are very important predators in the marine ecosystem. Uh, like in the lower right, you see that weird looking thing with all the, the, the thorns. That's the crown of thorns sea star, and that's actually caused all kinds of problems in an ecosystem where it goes in and destroys the ecosystem. Keystone species are species in an ecosystem that have the most effect on that ecosystem uh, remaining intact or being bothered. Right, we call it a keystone species. It is if you went in and removed, if you could pick one species to remove that would cause the greatest effect on the environment, that would be the keystone species. It it get it might be easier to understand it. It gets its name from, you know, they used to build the old stone archways. God, I draw for crap. That rock at the top was the keystone. 
right? So you pull this rock out, the arch collapse. That's where the name comes from. Uh, and sea stars, they differ from another group of, uh, of, of, of star uh, organisms that we'll talk about in the next slide. Uh, they differ from them because the central disk is not sharply demarcated. What I mean by that is where the leg ends or where the leg begins and the disk uh, ends isn't real clear. See, so they kind of blend into one another, even on that one there, very much so on the one the guy's holding in his hand. They also, uh, the legs also taper. Most have five arms or multiples, but not all of them. This is, uh, this is natural. This is a Florida species, and it's got nine arms, so not even, not even groups of five. So no monocot, dicot on this guy. Uh, the other a, a type of star is the Ophiroidea. These are the brittle stars, uh, and they have a central disk that's very obviously demarcated, right? So where the disk stops and the arm begins, very obvious. And the arms uh, don't taper, maybe a little bit at the tips. Uh, they have tube feet, but they don't have suction cups. They use them for mo moving around and thrashing. Uh, cool videos online. You can actually see these guys come out of the water and move along, along the beach. They can actually move their arms and thrashing and crawling around. And using these tube feet to get traction, they can flop their way, uh, they can flop their way out on a, uh, onto the beach. There's some neat videos. You can just imagine you lay on the beach and this black, furry-like arm thing comes crawling out of the water. It would freak you out, man, for sure. Uh, the arms come off very easily. This is a predator uh, duress kind of thing. You see in the lower right that species. That's why they're called brittle stars. The arms very easily automatize. Very tough word to say. Automatize. So automatize is uh, when a lizard drops its tail, that's automatizing. So they do that very easily. Again, that's why they're called brittle stars. Uh, a lot of very common species in the deep, deep, deep ocean, the abyss. Sea urchins and sand dollars, the sea biscuits are all echinoidea. There are no, no arms, but they do have tube feet. Uh, and this real pretty one on, uh, on the right, the blue area is the tube feet. They have double rows of tube feet. This is the test. There's the double row of tube feet. So it's got five of those double rows of tube feet. Uh, spines, that's how obviously their protection. They're movable. Uh, sea stars can move, or sea urchins can move very slowly, but it's uh, being set off for the most part. They're going to use these spines to defend themselves. They can use them a little bit to be moving around. Uh, that's all very cool, but one of the coolest things about members of this group is if you ever broken open a sand dollar, you might have saw this little star thing inside. Well, a little star thing that, uh, that that's inside of the sand dollar is something called Aristotle's lantern. It's a unique structure only found in this group. Now, Aristotle drew it, so that's his little picture right there. That's where the name comes from. But take a look at this. What this this is their mouth. This is how they feed, right? So if you've ever looked at the bottom of a sea star, you see these little uh, uh, teeth-like projections sticking out, right? Well, the way those teeth-like projections work is they're connected through a hinge to these calcareous plates and these muscles right here these protractor muscles and these retractor muscles, this protractor muscle pulls this way. Muscles only pull. And what that does is that causes the plate to pivot that way. And when the plate pivots that way, it pushes against the teeth. It causes, pushes that way. The tooth goes this way. And then when the retractor muscle pulls the other way, it pulls the plate back, the teeth come close. So they use this for nipping along as they're grazing. I think in biology, this is one of my favorite things, this Aristotle's land. Just looking at the incredible complexity, how how that, you know, through evolutionary time, how that came about, just to me is mind blown. That's amazing, this little star. So the next time you uh, uh, are around a sand dollar, and if it's broken open and take a look at that, have a little more appreciation, realize how incredibly unique and how specialized that Aristotle's lantern is. Plus, that just sounds cool, right? Aristotle's lantern. Somebody breaks open a sea star to be, or a sand dollar. Oh, Aristotle's lantern. You sound instantly smart, don't you? This is a weird group. Uh, feather stars can also come out on the land. There's a there's a picture of one crawling out onto the beach too. Feather stars are actually related to echinoderms. They're feather stars or sea lilies. Uh, look very much like what they did 500 million years ago during the Cambrian explosion. They're a living fossil. There's a there's a fossil of feather stars. Uh, male and female with a free-swimming larvae, a sessile juvenile, 
that evolves into a sessile adult, or in the case of feather stars, into a free-moving adult, but they're suspension feeders with their mouths facing upward and have a U-shaped gut, so the anus is next to the mouth. It's kind of like they're fouling in the, in, the, in the gastropods yesterday. Remember the snails? I was talking about how their body gets twisted around and their anus dumps out over their, their head, which doesn't make any sense. But uh, in the water where these organisms live, you can get away with that a little bit more because it's much more dilute. Can, can you imagine just laying on the beach and this thing like this crawls out? <laughs> what the heck is that, man? And then the, the last group of conoderms is equally as bizarre. They're the sea cucumbers, I guess, because they look like a cucumber. Uh, very common in deep ocean, uh, soft body. Their endoskeleton has been reduced. The oral tube uh, feet or the tube feet have been modified orally into feeding tentacles. So these are tube feet. There's also some two feet spread along the side as well. Uh, these are very common to detritivores. So they move along the uh, ocean or along the bottom, feeding on a detritus decaying organic matter. Consumed not only by uh, marine animals, but we eat them too. Here's a, here's a plate of sea cucumber. That looks just tasty, doesn't it? Never had that. I'm not sure what that would taste like. Uh, they actually breathe through their anus. What they do is they uh, bring water up into their anus and 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 pass it off into a respiratory tree. Uh, a respiratory tree is kind of like the tracheals in the insect. A respiratory tree is a series of uh, uh, vascularizations that get thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner so that diffusion can occur. So uh, off of the anus of sea cucumbers, there is this uh, pouch that has all these little tiny channels in it the water can move into and get thin enough to, to allow diffusion to take care of its needs. Uh, there, there it is again, it spits out its internal organs, which then it then regenerates, right? And that's the sea stars do too with the leg and things we're talking about. That's, that's really interesting from a medical point of view. Whew, that's chapter 33. We got, all we got left is the core dates now. We'll start on that on Tuesday. So that's the, the vertebrate organisms that we'll go through. And we'll spend uh, a few lectures talking about them. So uh, Monday, remember your exam over uh, plants. We don't have fungus on the lecture exam. Uh, and then your lab on Monday is the uh, dissection, the first animal lab, the dissection of the roundworm. I'll have the lab for you to pass out. And other than that, I don't have anything else. If anybody's got any questions, by all means. If not, y'all have a good weekend. Take care and I guess try to Try to stay dry somewhat, although we do need to rain. So I'll take care then. You're welcome, Suzanne. Have a good day. Hi, Jesse, you still there? Did you fall asleep?